Hello, everybody, and welcome to the talk. I'm Brian Sharp, a senior rendering developer at Cytofix, and today I'll be discussing Karma XPU, Cytofix's new open USD based GPU CPU renderer. So, what is this talk about? First, there is an introduction to Houdini, Solaris, OpenUSD, and MaterialX. Then I'll discuss Karma XPU and our upcoming version one release. I'll then give a quick overview of some of the latest features. And to finish, I'll give technical details on how Karma XPU and some of the new features are implemented. So first off, what is Houdini? Houdini is a visual effects creation package used for film, TV, and video games. Its fully procedural workflow allows for easy creation of visually rich assets and visual effects. Houdini has existed for over 25 years and is a staple for anyone working in the visual effects industry. What is OpenUSD and what is Solaris? OpenUSD, with the USD standing for Universal Scene Description, is an open source 3D scene description and file format used for content creation and interchange between tools. It was initially developed by Pixar and as we've seen today, is fast become a standard within the visual effects industry. Solaris is a suite of look dev, layout, and lighting tools within Houdini, which are used to create and edit USD scenes. Solaris also makes use of Hydra, USD's rendering framework, which provides a plugin system for renderers. This means Solaris is compatible with many different renderers, such as Cytofix's Karma, which I'll talk about soon, Pixar's Renderman, Autodesk's Arnold, Maxon's Redshift, AMD's ProRender, and more. Before I get into Karma, I'll quickly mention MaterialX. At SideFX, we embrace open standards, as it really empowers our users by giving them flexibility. To that end, we've adopted MaterialX. MaterialX is an open standard for representing materials in computer graphics. It's open source, part of the Academy Software Foundation, and already has widespread support in the industry. Houdini allows for creation of MaterialX directly in its FOP NodeGraph UI. It's even possible to mix MaterialX nodes with other native Houdini nodes. So it really has uh, fit naturally into Houdini. So what is Karma? Karma is a Hydra-based renderer developed by SideFX and designed for use with Solaris. And being Hydra-based, it also works with other USD Hydra-based applications. What you can see in this image is Karma working in the standalone USD view application. Karma CPU is the CPU only version of the renderer and is currently fully featured and production ready and is out now in Houdini 19.5. It supports both FX and Material X for shading. Now what is Karma XPU? Karma XPU is a GPU capable accelerator for Karma. It's not designed to replace Karma CPU but rather be a high performance alternative with a slightly reduced feature set. XPU means that rendering can happen on GPU or CPU, producing identical results on each, or both at the same time. And it's multi-GPU capable, meaning adding GPUs improves performance in a linear manner. Karma XPU is very fast, where we're often seeing a 10 to 20x speed up with a single GPU. It supports material X for shading, and it's currently available in beta in Houdini 19.5, and will be releasing version one gold in Houdini 20 later this year. So what are the benefits of XPU? <laughs> Firstly, it makes use of all resources on the computer. It's multi-GPU. It's also fail-safe, meaning that if a device fails, for example, runs out of memory, the other devices automatically pick up the load and finish the frame. Another advantage is that any scene will run on any machine. So if a scene is authored on a high spec machine, it can still run on a lower spec machine, even one without a GPU. Rendering could be scheduled on a CPU render farm or a GPU render farm. The results will always be the same. This gives flexibility to wranglers in large studios. Now before I show some of the new features, I'm going to play this short one minute clip showing some of the recent work that people have done with XPU. Enjoy.
We have a longer version of that playing at the Houdini Hive if anybody wants to check it out. Now into some of the new features coming in Houdini 20. We've really worked on our volumes. They're now, first class, they're now a first class object with full support. So that means full AOVs, primvars, light linking, light path expressions, the works. We've also optimized them a lot. We've added uniform volumes, which are used for oceans and fog. And we've added frost and volumes, which is a common feature request from our more production focused clients. We've also added more features to our base shader. So now you can mix two anisotropic lobes, allowing for sun halos and rim lighting on clouds. We've also added extinction and contribution modifiers, which allows someone to achieve a white puffy cloud with only a small number of bounces. We've improved lighting. So we've added geometry lights and also a physical skylight, which is like a procedural dome light which simulates a physically correct sky. With it, you can achieve sunsets on the horizon and such. We've added IES profiles and also light filter shaders, which are shaders which can be attached to light sources, as can be seen with this projector. We've also improved sampling across the board, meaning lighting overall is more efficient. We've improved our liquids. So that includes nested dielectrics, which is when you can have things like ice within water, within a glass. There's also absorption, where transparency can change over depth. And also dispersion, which is when light splits into a rainbow when it refracts through glass. Here is a whiskey glass showing nested dielectrics. And there's also subsurface scattering on the ice cubes. Very cool. We've added a bunch of shading features as well. So that includes hex tiling, which is a nice way to tile a texture over a surface without it appearing repetitive. We have a room mapping tool, which creates a parallax correcting room effect, useful for buildings and cityscapes. We now support rounded edges as well as point clouds. We also have a new fur material, which extends the existing hair material to handle physically correct fur. So that include, includes things like um, the medulla, which is a, a small cylindrical structure within the head strand itself. And we're seeing some cool things people are doing with the fur material, such as this eagle here, where the fur BSDF has been used for the barbs on the feathers. We also have a physical lens, which allows for special lens warps, blurs, and bokeh effects. We've added automatic ray bias, crypto mat, deep output, full color space support, and much more. We invite you to take a look when Houdini 20 is released later this year. So now on to some of the more technical details. First up, what is an XPU device? Any compatible piece of hardware is viewed as a device. Any number of devices found on the computer are used for rendering, meaning Karma XPU is also multi-GPU. Currently, NVIDIA GPU devices and CPU devices are supported. Other hardware will come with time. Here's a diagram showing the overall architecture of Karma XPU. Scene data comes in from USD through Hydra, shown on the left. Karma XPU then converts the scene data to a form suitable for the device rendering code to consume. The CPU device is able to start rendering immediately by reading the data directly from host memory. The GPU device must first copy the data from host memory to its own device memory before rendering. The render is processed iteratively by taking a fixed number of passes over the image, for example, 128. Firing a single path out of each pixel for each pass and accumulating the result into the final image. XPU devices each render a single pass individually with the index being determined by an incrementing counter. They then accumulate it into the final image and assigned a new pass to render. This process is repeated until the image is complete. It allows some devices to be more efficient than others, meaning some devices can, can render many passes and others only a few. Random number generators are indexed by their pass ID, meaning this process is deterministic. So rendering on one system will produce the same result as rendering on another with a potentially different setup. If a device fails mid-render, 
then its incomplete pass will be picked up by another device and rendered, meaning the system is very fail safe. If those two slides seem familiar, it's because we gave a talk at GDC 2022 on the architecture of XPU, which went into much more detail than you've seen today. For anyone interested, I suggest you take a look. Now onto some newer features. We've implemented subsurface scattering, which allows for effects such as skin and snow. We've implemented standard random walk subsurface scattering. The steps taken are for the path to first enter a mesh using a Lambertian profile, seen as this red semicircle. We then randomly walk within the medium. If we hit the mesh again, we move the path to the exit point and continue, again via a Lambertian profile, seen as this blue semicircle. Otherwise, we terminate the path, so we have an upper limit on the number of steps we can take. The mesh should be manifold. Multiple important sampling can be used to handle chromatic extinction, such as in this Disney paper. We thought divergence might hurt performance, but it's been fast in practice, so we're very happy with the result. Up next is uniform volumes. So uniform volumes are homogeneous volumes bounded by a manifold container mesh, and are often used for oceans and water. As shown in our previous architecture talk, our volumes are handled by ray marching in an intersection program. But how can we ray march the interior of the mesh without firing rays during the ray marching step, because optics doesn't allow for that? What we do is first cast a single spans ray through all the container meshes. It uses an any hit program to capture a sorted list of the closest n hits. A hit point is stored as its distance, whether it's a front face or back face, and its object ID. And because we don't need to execute a shader to collect any of that information, it's fast. The list is then used by the path tracing ray to correctly ray march the interior of the container mesh. Now for some lighting gems. We have improved sampling on our cylinder lights, which now take into account both distance and angle along the central axis of the cylinder. So this can be seen in the white diagram. The cylinder itself is the gray box, but we sample along the central, central axis, which is that line in black. The assumption being that cylinder lights are usually long and thin, and if we get a short one, then sampling reduces to uniform sampling anyway. Anyone wanting to experiment with this themselves can look into techniques such as equiangular sampling, as in this paper by the Arnold guys, and also product sample, sampling, as in this paper by David Hart and others at NVIDIA. We also clip the light geometry where possible, so that will be conservatively clipping against the plane defined by the surface position and the shading normal. We do this for both cylinder lights and rectangle lights. And because the lights still retain their original shape, a rectangle stays a rectangle and a cylinder stays a cylinder, we can continue to use existing techniques to sample the clip shape. Here are some images showing the combining of the techniques, and apologies for the contrived scene. So here's a rectangle using standard spherical triangle sampling. Here we are adding in product sampling. And here it is with spherical triangle sampling, product sampling, and clipping. Again, spherical triangles, spherical triangles with product sampling, and here's the added clipping. Notice the box on the left improved a lot. And here's cylinder lights with standard uniform sampling, equiangular sampling, then equiangular sampling with clipping. And again, the box on the left improves. So uniform sampling, equiangular sampling, equally angular sampling with clipping. Now I'm going to acknowledge some NVIDIA tech that we found very useful while developing XPU. Optics 7 has been very good, we fully recommend. In, <laughs> in, in particular, the curves are very fast. Our, opti, um, our customers are often com, uh, commenting on how fast their hair and fur assets render with XPU. There is NVRTC, which is NVIDIA's runtime C++ CUDA compiler which has been great for our runtime shader compilation. A tip for anyone wanting to deploy software that uses NVRTC is to look into the Jitify project, which provides placeholders for the C standard library. We've made use of the new self-intersection avoidance library, which is used to implement our automatic ray bias feature. MDL has also been very useful. It implements MaterialX, and it's open source, which allows for flexible use, as well as being a great reference for BSDF math. And then there's Nano VDB, which has given us very fast volumes. Before I finish, I'd like to acknowledge other hard-working members of the SideFX rendering team, 
as well as many others from SideFX, and also the Houdini community for helping out with that awesome clip. And that's it. Thanks, NVIDIA. Thanks, SideFX, and thank you.